and archaeology, as I mentioned. Now, uh, this is this has sort of gone down okay. Um, it's been it's been at times awkward, uh, but it starts off uh, with part of a university presentation um, I made in August, and it's to do with the reason why we why we went to Shetland in the first place, and why um, I ended up doing my master's degree. Um, involved in Shetland um, and then it leads on to uh, the answer which is part two and then we've got some images which is part three or whatever I can get through so th this this just go with me on the flow on this this was uh, this was what I what I did uh, this is my dissertation title comparison of the use of space within two near contemporary but widely separated settlements uh, the ditches Roman Villa Bagadon Gloucester and Scatnet Croft in Shetland so Shetland, we mentioned Shetland there already. So it's good. it might be awkward to get to grasp with this, but it starts to come together. Uh, so that was my dissertation. Um, it was 25,000 words long, so I had to cut 10,000 words out of that, which was grinching. Um, but initially I was going to be studying the um, Roman occupation of, of Orkney, Shetland and uh, North East Scotland. Um, but for whatever reasons, unbeknown to me, I was steered to do something completely different, um, and that's what my master's degree is in. So, um, let's start off. We're, we're, this is the place that we're going to go to. It's known as um, Skatnes Broch. Um, and the interesting thing about Skatnes Broch, I've been studying it for eight months, and I suddenly, uh, the first experience we've got of uh, seeing Skatnes, was to wait for a, tr a plane to land on the runway that we were using as the road. Um, now this is going to come together. In 1975, 1977, they were building um, an access road to the airport. And that access road went directly through um, an unknown archaeological site known as Skatnes, old Skatnes. It, it went through um, a chunk of the settlement which was eventually excavated years later. They recorded none of the archaeology there. The site that they went through was completely destroyed because uh, only, it was only until the mid-1980s that they actually employed an archaeologist on the island to um, record these archaeological sites up until the 1980s because there was a, an oil boom in Scotland. Um, the government allowed um, anything to be destroyed at its whim. Um, and by the time the archaeologists had got there, all, all the damage had been done. We lost um, dozens and dozens of um, intact Viking sites, Norse sites, Iron Age sites, uh, medieval sites at the whim of the oil boom. Um, and this was no such exception. Um, and the, the row, uh, I can remember the first, I could see this site in the distance, and I could also see a plane landing in front of me. Um, as they sh shut off the road, they had a guy on the side of the road stopping traffic. This is how it was. Stop. This is only a few months ago. Stopping traffic like this. So we all stopped. The plane landed in front of us. Um, and then as he looked, he thought, right, the planes are gone. Uh, so we all used that bit of the road then to get to the other side. And this is now. You don't believe me anyway, but this is now. Um, and then to get back off again, we had to wait for another plane to land. To get back out. It's great. This is how it works out there. But um, very recently, 20, 28 people killed in a plane crash because the plane missed the runway and ended in the sea. Um, there, and, and, uh, um, a Royal Mail plane went down a, a year or so earlier. You know, those things, types of things. So it's quite an exciting trip. Anyway, that's the Shetland bit. And the other bit of my, um, my, other bit of my work was looking at um, a site. Uh, which is just um, north of Sirencester, um, known as Bagadon in Gloucestershire. Um, now, this will all come together in a short while, but go with me a flow on this. Uh, archaeologists use something called methodologies, um, which is something I really usually steer away from. Um, now, I was, I was having to compare these two sites, looking at two and a half methodologies. And what methodology says, 
by a guy by the name of Hillier and Hansen in a book known as Spatial Syntax, published in 1984. Um, I, had to, I had to look at this, and I, um, the, the, the theory of this is that everything in the past is to be seen in the form of lines, numbers, and there's no sense of humanity. In other words, the past has no face. The past is simple and can be explained as a scientific equation. So I had to look at the two sites looking at that. And then I had to look at the sites um, using this guy, Tim Ingold, 1993, writing uh, a, a perception of landscapes and tarscapes in his book, uh, Temporal Temporality um, of the Landscape. And when I was, when I was using this, uh, Ingold's 1993 book, um, it was it, instead of completely looking at things in the space of lines and numbers, um, I was looking at um, the landscape um, as as multi-dimensional. The past is to be seen in the form of um, not in the form of layers, but everything uh, intermingling. This building that we're in was built a um, hundred years ago, but we're still in it. But we're now. Um, I'm touching a wall that was painted a few years ago. All those different things, all those things, multi-dimensional. I'm speaking now, but, but there'll be somebody else speaking here in about three hours' time. That's how the past should be seen. Um, and that's how I've always seen the past. So using the other one to see the past as a load of lines was, also, was really difficult. Uh, but then I, I used another, another one, which is this guy, Rappaport, that believed that the past should be seen as... Um, the past should be seen as a stage. So everything in the past is a stage with actors upon it. Um, we, us looking at the past today are actors looking at the past, viewers of the past. Um, and that's another way I was looking at it. Anyway, moving on. So this is all complicated stuff. Is that post-processionist A post-processionist archaeology, yeah. Um, anyway, this, this is, this is um, the site of Scatness. Um, and the building that I was actually looking at was this building here, alongside a broch. <coughs> and this, because I couldn't do the whole thing, yeah? Um, so without sort of overcomplicating this, keeping it simple, this is the building I was studying as part of an overall settlement. It had a building alongside it. That'll sort of come into play in a short while. Um, so, I'm just going to mention the first bit um, of this. Entering the world of Ingold, at times alongside the work of Rappaport, who is the one who saw life in the past as a stage, we journey through the concepts of time and landscape, which are simply not one-dimensional. So that was very important. That's the way I was looking at it. Temporality of the landscape is a work that Ingold published um, 19, um, 1993. So what I was doing uh, was looking at everything as being really complicated. Everything in the past has a sound and a voice. Um, even a rock moves over a period of time. Even a shadow is all relevant in the past. How you interpret the shadow. In fact, the past is really complicated. But some archaeologists believe that the past is a simple a mathematical equation. And they do believe that. And in fact, um, at times, I was convinced of that as well. But one thing I did realise in looking at the master's degree was something um, that, uh, that, that really sort of um, told me another story. Uh, when I went to Siren Sestin Museum, um, I, I had the archives of the, the Roman villa at Bagadon for the whole day. They were mine. Um, and uh, it was really strange. I had a room full of boxes, full of artefacts, and a lo loads of charts and stuff. Um, and, and I, had, I had a box. One was full of uh, silver coins and brooches and, um, you know, cut stones and all sorts of wonderful things. And I thought, not interested. And there were things that I was interested with these things. Because you can see all that silver stuff in a display cabinet in a museum anytime. This is the stuff I was interested in. Um, the, the stuff that archaeologists are not usually interested in. Uh, uh, daub or brigantage is basically uh, the heated up remains um, of the daub that's been placed on an outside panel um, of a building um, at a Roman um, or an Iron Age site. Basically the daub on the framework 
around the building. Okay? But the daub is all that's left. Now, you're looking at this and you could sort of get an idea of texture, feel and look. And that's what I was interested in. Um, and then I had to compare it against this. Uh, the principle, this is here, and Hanson, the idea of space. Oh, and the other thing as well is one thing I've missed out completely. The other guy, you know, the thing about the sensual landscape and the temporality of landscape and all the rest of it. Don't get um, too het up with these silly words. Um, um, he, uh, the other guy, Ingold, believed that the past shouldn't be seen as enclosed or space. Okay? You can't put things in boxes. Let me explain. Um, if you've got, if, if you've got um, a flat surface and you've got a hole in it, right, that's not a space. There's something in it. There's air in it. There's no such thing as space. Okay? Uh, this side is not space. This side is not space. It's all integral and all interweaving. This, this is not really a space because you can get out. There's, there's, there's walls. Everything's interconnected. Um, so Ingold didn't believe in the sense of space. But these guys did. They believe that you could put a line from um, this room to another room and go from here and there. All mathematical stuff. And to be honest with you, I see reading some of this mathematical stuff on a Sunday morning half the time, not understanding half of it. Well, not understanding any of it, really. Um, but, um, in other words, um, the past should be seen as, as, as um, not overcomplicated. Um, so here we go. The principle for which archaeologists attempt to reconstruct past lives and their experiences with these structures can be both very overcomplicated and not overcomplicated and without at times a scientific basis. Um, so what we try to do with these guys is to not overcomplicate things, uh, but to use uh, mathematics using the social logic of space. Um, and again, I managed to get my mind around it eventually, but it was a bit of a pain. Um, and these people um, who believe in space, you know, the Hillier people, 1984, um, believe that you can see buildings within circles, numbers, and lines. Okay? Um, and this is where this is where it gets interesting, right? To actually get interest, to get access into this building, um, you go forward into this unit. Okay, and you can either evolve around this way, you can go to this bit, you can go to this bit, you can go to this bit, or you can go around this way, and whatever, right? It's done as a chart. Now, I don't know if the penny's dropping, um, but that building, which is an Iron Age building from Scotland, is a little bit complicated, right? There's only one exit, there's one entranceway, there's no windows, Okay. There's a sense of being enclosed and, let's use that word, controlled. You didn't stop them leaving the other night, Glenn, there. You controlled them because you were the one who knew where the exit was. So if you look at that in that funny, weird way, that's how I started to see Iron Age buildings. Um, so don't need to do that bit there. But if you look at a Roman building, the Roman building that I was looking at, look how simplified this is. Right, you go down this, this corridor, this walled area, you go forward and you've got three exits. Not one, three. You can either go left, forward, or you can go right. So that's a little bit more open. But you know what? I've missed the point here. When you go into a Roman building, okay, um, immediately as you go into a Roman building, you can usually see light. Okay, you've usually got a window on the right, you've got an exit, you've got another window, you've got another window there, you've got a light. Very important, light, Roman building light, you can see, actually you can see your way out. That's important. So in your house, Ben, I'd right, say there was no windows, right, and you've got an exit over there, right, and they all come in by you, but nobody has any sense of where anything is in that room because you've turned the lights off, right? So in other words, you're standing in the middle of the year. You say, come in, guys. So they all come in, right? Door stands behind the wall, and they're all wandering around in the dark, right? Nobody knows where they're going. And you say, you say, follow my voice, boys. And they all go to you. You say, right. 
Let's go to find the exit. It's here. But you're controlling everybody in that room because there's no light. Roman buildings were not like that. Iron Age buildings were. Because if you if you turn off the switch in an Iron Age building, nobody could see anything. Yeah, why? Why? There's the practical reason why. Um, because if you've got windows, well, exactly. If you've got loads of doors, it lets the air out. But there are more, there are other reasons. Uh, there's the reasons that um, it's your building. Um, you decide what people do in that building. Okay? Um, I've been brought up like that. My my mum, there's certain rooms in the house we couldn't go into. That was it. They still like that. Um, so one one thing one thing I was thinking was that um, it, these two sites, the one in Scotland and the one in England, um, can they be compared? Are they similar, or are they totally different? And I first thought, because we're always told that Roman buildings were controlling buildings. Because they're built with linear walls and roofs and heating and this here, this there, everything was regular. I thought that was control, right? But then I started to realize that um, control means something completely different. If you can't see what you're doing, there's an F word there, and it ends with a D. This is the answer. Ah, oh. the answer. The answer to the fact that, um, you know, were Roman buildings controlling? The answer is no, these buildings were controlling. These were Iron Age buildings built in Shetland, Orkney, and North East Scotland, Scatland, Cape Town, I should say. Um, and you know, look, can you spot the windows, George? None. Spot the entrance. Spot the exit. You go in there, right? It's black. It's absolutely pitch black. And to, um, to allow the tourists to experience this building, they've actually widened the doorway because uh, there were fat people visiting the site. So they complained and they had to widen the doorway. There were tall people visiting the site, so they had to um, heighten the doorway. So now the light shines directly into the building, right? It's not dark anymore. But back in the day, um, the light sort of disappeared as you got into the centre. And the only way you'd be able to see inside this building, because there were, very, there were originally floors inside, and this is 13 and a half metres high, right? Um, the only way you could actually see in, into that building is that you had a light, a light switch, which they didn't. Uh, the, the fire in the centre would not have given off enough light for you to see anyway, right? Because if they burnt peat at 200 degrees C, it doesn't give more, off much light. Bill seen this demonstrated at... Um, um, Scarabray, I think, haven't you got? So anyway, um, th this building is, is control. It, 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 um, everything about it is control. Uh, um, and and I, I will stick my bottom dollar on that. One of the lecturers, absolutely, Martin hated me saying that, Bill. Doesn't the darkest strike indicate the probably the first possible thing we get in? No, Martin, come this community centre. But no, don't don't do that, Bill. Let's just spoil it. No, it's just divisive. It's not. It's going away from where we are. Yeah. It's an option, yeah. But I don't want to know what these buildings are for, right? Because this building didn't have a settlement around it. It was just this building. This is where people lived. It was a late block. Whether or not it was used for defence, whether or not it was used for sanctuary, whether or not it was used for people to live or as a community centre, frankly, I'm not interested. Right? What I'm interested in is when you've got into this building, not about what people see outside, when you get into this building, what do you do next? And that is the thing that I'm interested in. Yeah? Because the thing is, is, is these people lose lines and, and formulas and things, you know. Yeah. So you know, like spaces or yes. volume is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But of course, you've got to, you've got to find that. You've got to, show them that it makes a big difference that if people are involved and if people's perceptions yeah. then it makes a completely different experience. Yes, perceptions against lines, completely different experience. Um, 
Say it. No, that's not my question. No, that's not my question. It's not my question at all. The question... Right, let's go back to Glenda, right? You all go to Glenda's house, right? You all go to Glenda's house and you come in through the door. Well, I love you around doors because you know you're out there yet. So, you open this door and you come in and, you're, and there's five of you and you say, Glenda's over there, you can't see her, and it's pitch black. Right? Glenda decides what you see. So, she's got a light over here, right? You all know what the exit is, right? Uh, if there's a light over there, you know where the um, where the hallway is, right? If you've got a light above the table, Glenda, make sure that your feet are above the table, right? Glenda's the one in charge. Do you see that? Yeah. That 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 is the point. Yeah. See what well, you fell. You just fell, fell into the trap. You fell into the trap of let's talk about what these buildings are they defensive and all the rest of it. I hear that so many times, Bill. We do that all the time. Let's just do something different. Go on. It's uh, oh, okay. Intimidation, right? Okay, okay. Then let's. Also, can you? Are you saying you can't measure that? You what, can't what, measure it. What? What? what it's so complicated. It's so complicated to measure that yeah, so because a, a person who owns that building yeah, will have a like, different experience from somebody outside who's an outsider so it or a stranger. Like the first round type thing, because they know exactly what was in it, and they yes. know what went yeah. You didn't have a clue. I feel free in your bit, right? If you're going to attack a tower like that, yeah. right? You're not going to know where the hell you are. There's stairs over there, there's stairs over there. And if the people inside can can keep that level of control, yeah. the tower itself becomes a self-defense mechanism. Okay? You know those those old, old ideas about a staircase? Okay, the Newell mm. staircase? That you, you have to go this way when your sword hand is here, so the people upstairs can, can attack you, but you can't attack them. It's that concept. So there's a spiral stair right inside. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that, no I've added that on. I, that, what I just said, was a metaphor. But it is right, because it always are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, 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 there's, there's this stairwell going all the way to the top. Right. And it's, only, it's the only site that I've ever been to that health and safety is completely absent. To, to, be, to, be, to be honest with you, right, um, you would only need one single person to defend this tower. One. So if you're talking about defence, you need one person. That's it. The, I wanted to move away from defence because it was completely divisive to what I was trying to get at. Right. So which is great. Anyway, let's move on. So in other words, what I concluded um, was that um, what I concluded, the, the wider implications for archaeological um, method in general used here and discussed of social difference between the Iron Age and Roman period communities in Britain are, it seems, when placed into practice, very exacting of the many pre key preconceived parameters that are currently understood about the two uh, cultures. And what that means is that these preconceived parameters are wrong. So in other words, what we feel what I mean by that is Roman Britain was really controlling, the Iron Age wasn't. I found out that it was the other way around. Um, we're wrong, um, wrong about one issue. It was not until the discussion went under the heading how different the sites are, used the methodology as it detected how starkly different the two sites were. This capitalist structure projects the indication that insiders and outsiders were much more controlled than those at the Roman site. So you lot are outsiders when you go to Glenda's house. Um, outside, uh, the in, you're the inside of Glenda. You're the one in charge. Which was, to say the least, a shock. And Scatless, after being overpowered by the experience, <coughs> what we mean by that, the experience, I'll tell you now what the experience is, that, if you go up, with the, with the sites of Scatless, right, what they did, they had a settlement around the tower. So the building that I'm talking about, was around the side of Scatness, and this one didn't have a settlement because it was late. So you can imagine, you go in into this building, right? You, you, you're a visitor into this building. The one on the right of this, right? You're going into the building. And the first thing you see on the left is this huge, massive tower. 
13 to 14 meters high. It's the biggest thing you will have ever seen in your life. It's absolutely massive. So, so as tall as this building, right? It's huge, right? And you're looking up thinking, Christ. and then the next thing you hear, you, you, um, you hear the crackling and crunching as the stone as it's dealing with different pressures and heat. And you see up in the air, you see guillemots flying around. Yes, we found guillemots at some of these sites, so we know they were there. And then you hear somebody napping in the distance. And, and then you hear voices. And then you, then you go into this building. You go into this building from the light and you're into the darkness and you think, oh my God, where the hell am I? And then you hear a voice and you follow the voice and you sit alongside the fire. Tell you what, if you go into a bloody public meeting, Christ. Um, so in other words, that gives a different meaning. So if these are community centers, right, the person who's leading the community can have you all sitting down. You don't have any facial, um, I'm saying, right, I'm going to do this this week, right? And you're all going to do it. And I don't care what you think because I can't see your faces. I tell you what, if we had, if we had lots of meetings that decided on people's reactions in the room, okay? If you all started to fall asleep, I'm going to go now, right? But if I don't know you're all falling asleep like that, right? Um, actually, you know what I mean? All these things are really important. Um, so here we go. And this, this back, back to this as well. We're going to come to the end of this now because I want to do the Roman stuff um, as soon as. Um, so here we go. Um, Acts gets at this after being overpowered with the experience of sensual perception of light and dark. Light to dark could be detected as a controlling factor. Moving from the light into the darkness when there... Um, was then a controlling element of where to move next. You are uh, to be manipulated. So somebody calling to you over here, or if you've got a light over here, you follow the light, you won't follow the light. What, what do they always say? Never follow the light. That's my son. Uh, never follow the light, okay? It's a warning. Never follow the light. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Um, the levels of depth the further you enter, um, forget about the faces. Now. The further you enter the building, the less ability there is to escape. And I'll explain that in a minute. You'll see it. And then we'll finish on that. And again, light is used to control movement. This concept is undeniably present. Um, that uh, could uh, even be postulated as a barrier to free movement in England. Right? So, so um, I, but I did that before I, I, I ended in the PhDs, uh, the, PhD, the, 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 the master's degree. But what I'm trying to say by that is that um, there was levels of control looking at these different methodologies. And if you look at this next chart, you know exactly what I'm saying. Look at this. Now, this is the mathematical approach, but it's very stark. Now, Glenda, this is your house, right? Phil's decided to do. Um, and the, the, the fire isn't lit. You've decided to have no light. Well, what Glenda's going to do is you're going to have to tug on to her, um, her garment, right? So she's taking, she wants, you, she wants to take you into the kitchen because she wants you to do some work in the kitchen. So you're tugging onto her garment. So you come in from the light into the darkness. It's pitch black now because you, you, you've been out of the sun. So you're being taken here, right? So, um, you're being dragged along, you've got onto a garment, Phil, and, and you're going to have to feel your way through with your feet. And on the walls, you're going to have to feel your way through. Oh, it's all touchy feely, and we know this because at some of these sites, in certain areas, the stone is worn. So we know all that. Um, and then you go by a little bit of a kink, you take it this way, okay? And you take it over to here, and there's no light. And then I go like this. And you and you and you think and Phil's thinking, I've got no soul, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I am. Right? I've got no idea where I am. And then um and then Glenda turns around and says, actually, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna light the fire so you can at least see a little bit. And you're not gonna be able to leave that structure safely without Glenda's help. Because you're not gonna know where the exit is. Um, no, no. Practicalities. What practical reason could there be for you to leave 
No, no, no. This, 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 you can imagine that there's no windows in the structure at all. This light does really, this light does not permeate the centre of this building. Uh, this tiny little exit here, we don't know if it was really used. Okay, so there's no way out. Yeah. Um, so say, say for example, um, somebody said, right, I want you to sleep over there. Okay. I want you to sleep, we're going to turn out the fire. You wake, you wake up in the middle of the night, you want to pee. You can, you're going to have to go where you stand, basically, because you're not, you're not going to have any orientation. Right? They would have, but you'd have had to have lit it. Okay? I, hang on, hang on, one sec, one sec. But, I've missed out one important key point, okay? Blender knows the internal work into this structure with her eyes closed because she's lived here for many years. An insider would know where everything worked. And the point being is that this building is for the people who live here, not for the outsiders. This is your property, it's your understanding of the property, and that's the point. It's not built for the outsider, it's built for the insider. Roman buildings were built for everyone. They were built for the visitor. Do you see my point now? They were built for the visitor and everyone. The Roman civilization was all inclusive. Iron Age civilization wasn't. And that's the point. Got it? He's yeah. making a comparison, Bill. You're not, you're not getting it. The Roman and the Iron Age. Not... Why is doing that? No, I co and I've completed the masters. I've got the masters. Yeah, yeah but anyway. Why do they draw this? No, well, this is control. Yeah. Is the reason for it? No, it's it's based. No, no the the reason is the reason is simple because there is no reason. The reason is simple. It's Glenda's house. Because the family needs it's to know where everything is. Yeah, you know. Iron Age and Pergamon, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's the sense of perspective. It's a sense of ownership. Glenda owns the house. She knows where everything is. With the Eyes blindfolded. It's not for you. You're invited in, but you've got, you're going to have no control over it. So this is part of the community. Yes. So the outsiders, they're saying, oh no, that's it. Oh no, and so you've got another building, so you, this, is, this is Glenda's home and her family home. So she's very, very high street at the moment. No, didn't say that. No. She's a normal, everyday person. What about the other everyday person? Well, okay, okay, okay. That's those pictures you showed us, Carl. That's got them round houses on it. Yeah, that's the building we're talking about is that one there. Yeah. There's there's one there. Oh, okay. yeah. There's one there. There's one there. There's, they're all over the place. This building itself, I've had one of these buildings inside it. The bro when the block was originally built, it was likely that there were no buildings around the outside that stood alone, and then. What happened is that a family moved in here, built it similar to this one, and there's less space in here, so you may as well have this one. And this is what's going on. Massively thick, yeah. So, uh, are we getting somewhere? Hopefully. Uh, right, there are some answers to come up. Um, there are some answers to come up. Um, and uh, basically... Um, Yes. This is your comparison and, and what you feel the difference is and why certain things yes. don't work, why certain theories don't work. Exactly. And the other the other thing as well is this this, right? Um I it, it, you could clearly see it. And it, there there were some similarities between Scatness, um, Shetland, uh, and England. And the, the similarities were as follows. The one similarity uh, was that um, Shetland and southern England used to have loads of timber. So everybody built out of loads of timber. Fact one, that's fact. By the time the Romans were coming over to Britain, um, most of the durable timber for building structures 
was either used, gone, or the landscape was transferred over to agriculture, right? So you had to use stone. Shetland had lost most of its stone, so we had to use stone. So there's a similarity. Um, the, the other thing as well is, is the, um, the sense of colour. Um, the predominant colour when, when I was looking at the landscape of Gloucestershire was yellow. There was yellow in the fields, there was yellow crops, there was yellow buildings, there was yellow whitewash, very similar to back in the Roman period. Up in Scotland, on the other hand, uh, you would have had these grey outside buildings, but interestingly enough, they had this yellow render in the inside of some of these Iron Age buildings. Anyway, quickly moving on again. Done that. Oh, wrong one. Um, and the, the, the out, that's some of the outcomes. Uh, the outcomes, the, one of the major outcomes I come up with, other than everything I just explained, uh, was that um, the landscape and everything in it has these things known as time vehicles. That's a time vehicle because it tells a story. The bones of Bill are a time vehicle. The mummified remains of Pat are a time vehicle. Uh, this is a time vehicle. Piece of pottery, that's a time vehicle. Everything is a time vehicle if it survives. And what we mean by that, if that pen survives in exactly that state because it's made of plastic in a thousand years' time, that's moved in, that's, that's the same thing, right? Bad example, I prefer to use a coin. That's a time vehicle that moves in time and it hasn't changed, or it has changed for whatever. But these are all time vehicles. To obtain a more complete central experience of the information available, archaeologists need to look at more information. Not only the silver, did you see the link there, the silver artifacts that did what interested in them? I was interested in the plain stuff. We need to be looking at the plain stuff as well to demonstrate in a more appropriate manner past societies. And, the, and in the final dissertation, I came up with, um, uh, with, with one other thing. It was the fact that um, the, the past is about people with two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears. There was no disability in the past, mental or physical. Um, everyone had two arms, two legs, everything was fine. This is what archaeologists believe, mainly, uh, because archaeologists, 99% of them, none of them have any physical or mental disability at all, um, we're told. And those are the same people who write about the past of having no mental or physical disability, which is an absolute load of rubbish. Because um, lots of people would have had disability in the past. And you've hit it upon the nail, Bill and Glenda. If you're an insider without the ability to see, you know where you're going. If you're unable to hear, you exactly know where to go. If you've lost one of your legs or two of your legs, you're still able to access that building because you know it. It's about access and interpretation and the sense of that building. And I actually had this in the palm of my hand, okay, with gloves on. Um, but I did take my gloves off because there is actually the line of somebody from individual lines from 1,900 years ago. And do you know what? I put my finger, my thumb in there, and it fitted exactly all the original lines of the person who actually created this. This is actually a mould which has been put together of a little goddess-like figure, or a god figure, whatever it was. Actually, do you know what, right? I wasn't interested in what the figure was about at all. I wasn't. I didn't give a damn. What I was interested in was this. The, the sensual experience. Somebody made this, and do you know what? This is a time vehicle because it's the same as it was 1,900 years ago. It was absolutely amazing to touch this, and I thought, right, I know what I'm doing now, except I knew what, what I was doing about one and a half months before I was handed in the bloody dissertation. Um, it was in a box in Cyrus Esther Museum. This wasn't on display, it was in a box. And actually, actually, to be honest with you, I had silver brooches in front of me and, and coins and special uh, delicate um, stones and all the rest of it. I wasn't interested in them because I could see them in any museum. You can see where you're coming from, yeah. Yeah. You can be really connected.
Yes, it's connection. Most states would not recommend coming out of church and turning into an online and also not that as well as you said. You probably not keep doing it for more. I say that, but I'm say also saying you should go to the cop as well in these meetings. Well, um, I, I, I've, got, I've got to be honest now. Um, and when, when we went to uh, Killian um, Roman um, Fort, they had that excavation that day, and behind one of the, the storage cabins, uh, they had a huge pile of Roman tile, right? Which they weren't interested in, right? Now, that tile itself, there was fingerprints on it, um, goats wandering across it, um, th there was that to me, but they weren't interested in it. They were only interested in getting down to what the building was like, um, and which which is the tragedy. Now I am gonna I'm I'm gonna um, move if I can see it. Oh, oh, there it is. But you're gonna you're gonna say, but this is nothing about the Romans in Shetland. And what am I on about? Actually, I was originally gonna do um, a master's degree looking at the Roman occupation in Shetland, Orkney, and Scotland. Uh, but for probably reasons that I probably know about now, um, I was steered away from doing so. Um, so we ended up doing this comparison of things. So why Shetland? Okay, we've done it now. Degree, we've got it in reverse order. Degree, done, tick. Um, and then why I wanted to study that area in the first place and why that university is the second bit. <coughs> for over 200 years, historians... And I'm pretty cold now. Um, 200 years, um, historian scholars and lay people alike have speculated whether the Romans actually set foot on Shetland. Um, in the 1922 uh, publication, don't worry if you can't read it, um, um, a description of the Shetland uh, Islands comprising an account of the scenery, um, antiquities, and superstitions. Sunbur, which is the south of the island near. Um, Near that site I've, I've mentioned, um, um, Old Skatness, uh, which we leave to the south, the ground is rendered somewhat interesting by the evidence which is afforded of a Roman visit to Shetland. Um, and this was uh, written down in 1782, republished in 1822. I possess a note to the same effect, Mr. Lowe's handwriting, that they found a copper medal, probably a copper coin from Emperor Vespasian around AD 79. Um, um, reverse Judea Victor, victory over the Jews, um, had been formerly found in the south of the Shetland Islands, um, turned up by the plough. I, I have seen among the other coins a copper medal bearing the inscription of Galba, who was the a Roman emperor after the reign of Nero, um, AD 68. Um, and another coin of Vespasian, um, AD 79, and one of Emperor Trajan, um, AD um, 110. Um, and all these things have been found. And then it goes on to say um, that um, other antiquities up until about 1822, other coins, and a small Roman dagger known as a pugio, which would have been used by an infantry soldier, um, an ailer. Uh, he was a cavalryman. Uh, I said infantry soldier, I meant cavalry. Um, uh, that, um, and a pugo would have been carried by um, not an infantry, but cavalryman, an ailer. Um, and that was found on the island as well. Um, and the, there was talk of small um, Roman like fortifications. Now, it's difficult to miss a Roman fortification. Uh, there, there's, there's four banks, uh, organised as a square or a rectangle, with a ditch around the outside. Not many civilizations did then. Apparently a, there was a few in Shetland at the time. Adding to the intrigue, um, Fetna, which is a northern island of Shetland, not a southern island, 1924, 1933. Two feet in depth. Um, in, in a garden, two coins were found from Constantine the Great from AD 337 and Constantius II from about AD 350. Coins were found in good condition on the northern islands of Shetland. Um, and, and coins of Hadrian and a, a, a worn coin of Justinian I. 
Now, naturally, people conclude that these may have been trade items lost in the soil. Some people ask um, why um, very few coins have been found in Shetland today. I'll tell you why, right? Very little ground is found in Shetland today uh, because the, the nutrients um, are completely gone from it, so nothing will grow in it. But when, when, you're, when, when the land's being uh, ploughed, um, in close approximation with the ground that you're ploughing, you're going to pick up coins. That's where they're being found. Um, but it's likely that they weren't just for trading. And why? Because the Shetland Iron Age economy wouldn't have had trading coins. Um, the, the coins themselves may link um, to um, the early stages of when the Romans were in Scotland, um, i.e. Um, after um, the governor Agricola invaded Scotland um, and apparently defeated um, the people of Scotland at the Battle of Mons Grappius in AD 84, at which he was withdrawn from Scotland in disgrace after defeating the Scots, which doesn't make, dis which doesn't make sense. But around that time, it's said that Agricola sent a military campaign to Shetland. But because there's no archaeological evidence, other than these coins and a few other things, people have dismissed it, right? There's one problem with that. There's more information to say that the Romans invaded Scotland, Shetland, than there is to say that Julius Caesar had the same over here. There's only two pieces of archaeological evidence to say that Julius Caesar ever came to Britain, other than his own writings, which could, he could have completely made up. After all, he was the leader of the Western world at the time. In AD uh, 54, uh, BC, uh, 54 BC, sorry, 54 BC. Uh, and there we get a piece of evidence the other week about uh, the Julius Caesar fort being found uh, on the south coast in Kent. Um, we've got one helmet being found. Before that, that was the only evidence to say that Julius Caesar invaded Britain. But he defeated the Britons, didn't he? According to his own notes. But there's more information. There's more evidence in Shetland to say that Julius. Uh, there's more evidence in Shetland to say that the Romans got to Shetland than there is about Julius Caesar. But we 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 believe in the Julius Caesar stuff, and it's all about politics. The Scots want to feel that they've never been conquered by anyone, except the English. The Vikings um, and the Romans. Um, and, so, and the other thing to do with politics is this. When in the Shetland Museum, there were Roman artifacts on display. Roman artifacts in Shetland, great. If you go to the museum in Orkney, there's Roman artifacts in the cabinets that are labelled differently. <coughs> These Roman artifacts are copies um, made by people in Orkney. But they're not. They're the real thing. Pardon? There's lots of excavations since the 1980s in Shetland, but they, they do find Roman material, yeah, Sabian ware, pottery, coins, yes. Isn't it funded by Norway? <coughs> what, Shetland? Yeah. No, no, so that, that's long since gone. <coughs> and just a quick, about the, quick uh, few other things as well. Um, not only to do with uh, the invasion, which we mentioned, not only to do with the fact that the coins uh, were not sort of trade items in Scotland, they would have obviously been dropped. Um, but there's there's lots of indications that um, yeah, there must have been some links with Shetland. Um, even, though it was, uh, even though it was pretty far north, there must have been some links. So we, we've got the three areas indicating that, um, that the Romans got to, to Scotland by hook or by crook. But um, Scotland, Shetland, get whatever there. <coughs> so well, this is what I wanted to study, but I never ever got around to doing so. And as you can probably make out, um, so what's happening to all these things? Aren't you? It's, a, it's abandoned now. <coughs> the question is, it isn't abandoned. Um, I, I, I could do the PhD side of things. Which is to do with something completely different. That's to do with disability, um, and then. Yeah, and then I'll come back to the Roman stuff. So you do need that. It's like. 
what, what, what we're going to do, we're going to take a very, very quick break for a couple of minutes, and we're, we're going to do about another half an hour, and as you can probably make out, um, not only to do the parking today, um, I'm not feeling too good. So anyway, let's carry on. Right, Let, let's, let's, have, let's have a quick break, and any questions on anything that I've said, we'll have teas and coffees, and we'll have a break thing and whatever, we'll have a bit of a circulation. Can we talk about Raffles. Raffles. And what did he, um, he didn't really say, he never mentioned last night. I mean, yeah, I didn't agree. Let's not say that, I don't think he will. Oh. Well, he's got a way to get all that stuff. Off the back of a lorry. No. No. I just mean that, I mean, crikey. He's got a load of the stuff. It's not works. Anyway, so, um, what, what, I, what I want us to do is I circulate around the room. We've got to walk tomorrow with Estrid Owen. And, and I want you to start thinking about what you want me to do. I've got some weird ones coming up. Where can I put this in? Um, Where can I put it in? What about the flax industry? The flax industry? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know where. Yeah, there's a whole box. I think they'll put a whole one in. Um, so. Yeah. I'll have my cup. It feels awful. Right, and in future, right? The only thing. If you're ever going to park there again, just phone me and let me know. Do you know what? I, I thought, do you know, somebody phoned me, and I got... It wasn't me. I, I tried to put the bill. Anyway, that, that's that. So, um, George, I got your bag, it's in the car. Well, um... Oh, it don't matter, does it? No, no. Give it to you in the new year, that's fine. Yeah. Anyway, it's safe, it's safe, George. It's there, there. Right, if that's okay. Yeah. Right, okay, so good. Anyway, so uh, let, let's do that. <clears throat> Pat, you owe for a fictitious trip that we're not doing um, in a day's time. If you give me 50 quid, which is invisible, I'll be happy to sit down. None at all. Uh, one thing, one thing about Mouser. If we, if we look back a minute again, um, one thing about Mouser. It, it is dry stone, and looking at this, this building itself is, is basically meters away. So the Mouser building uh, dates to about 2,000 years ago, and this building dates to about um, 500 years ago. But strangely enough, but actually. Realistically enough, <coughs> this tower, is, this building itself, did not use a single piece of material from the brock. You would think that um, you know the brock itself, let's demolish it and let's build this house, but no, they didn't. Um, in places like Shetland, there's so much stone lying around, there is more hassle to demolish an existing building than it is to build a new one, and we see this everywhere. Um, in Shetland and Orkney, you get so many archaeological monuments. You get you get a sort of burial chamber over there, and you get a house over here. You're thinking, well, down in the south, we would like Avebury, for example. Uh, we would destroy all the stones at Avebury and build the church and everything out of it. But because there's so much stone lying around in places like Shetland, it's more hassle to demolish a building than it is to actually build um, using new material. <sighs> Hang on a minute. Dennis, higher. Okay. Okay. Look, 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 Dennis. What, what I'll do? I'm, I'm teaching the other class at this minute, so what I'll do. I'll give you a ring back in a short while. Okay. 
All oh, right. I, anyway, I'll give you I'll give you a ring about next week. Anyway, so I'll I'll, I'll speak to you later. Take care, Dennis. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sorry about that, guys. Um, it's basically saying I don't have to work this evening. Um. So back to what I was trying to get at. I'm sorry for that interruption. I, I don't usually get my phone usually, and I didn't even get the phone to my son earlier on. Um. The the point is that I think to try and put this across. Um. They, they didn't need to uh, demolish anything. They just used what was around them and just leave the old stuff there, which I think is hugely different from what we do. The amount of times I go and show people a monument and I say, well, there was a burial chamber here once, and I say, well, where is it? And I say, well, it's, it's over there. They've used it to build that house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Even the Roman villa down in um, Lanchford Lans Major, 50 years before it was properly recovered and, and recorded and excavated in 1886. Um, the archaeologist who got there, John Story, he was told that there was a lot more of the villa there 50 years ago, Roman columns around the, 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 the landscape and all the rest of it. But his dad, the farmer, the farmer who the, the John Story was talking to, demolished the Roman villa 50 years ago to build the farm out of. And this was less than 200 years ago this happened. Uh, but that wouldn't happen in Shetland. They would just leave it. And I don't know if you agree. Um, I don't know if you agree with this a statement, George. That it's far easier to build out of um, new material than it is to build out of old material. Is that correct? Well, it is if you're using sand cement. If they're doing just uh, plain walling, be be okay. But they didn't do it though. <coughs> they didn't do it though. That's the point. They didn't do it though, that's the point. Anyway, moving on with this. Looking inside the building, looking down into this building, um, what you can see is the, um, the conical shaped wall inside. Uh, and what would have happened, that there would have been floors inside. There would be something known as a scarcement level, that you'd have had a roof, and there would have been another floor on top of that. Can you imagine being inside there? There's no light coming from above. There's no light coming from the side. It would have been absolutely pitch black. There was a stair, there's a staircase that was going all the way to the top. But if you lived in a building like this, you wouldn't have needed a lamp or anything. You would have just felt your way all the way to the top. Why waste precious oil in a lantern when you could just follow the wall all the way to the top? And I think that's really important. Anyway, this is back in Mouser. Um, and there, there's. Um, What's that? Can you get all that cavity in between the two walls? Here. It's not a cavity. The, 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 that cavity itself um, carries a stairwell, and underneath the stairwells, you've got um, other other cavities and storerooms. So it goes all the way. So you've got the two walls. You've got an external wall and an internal wall, and it, between the two walls, you get ties, and those ties have cells underneath, um, and, and the stairwell follows that all the way to the top. And as as you as if, if you notice, there's all these little holes in as well. This is to sort of, if there's illumination inside, because there'd be different floors, that would give illumination to the stairwell. But from inside, this is not natural light. This is this is artificial light. And this is the top. And if you walk on the tops of these these here, uh, some of the stones are just hanging. Uh, there's no health and safety with the site, even though it's a Scottish heritage site. You look down. And you can see two or three meters of nothing below you, because that's where a cell or a cavity, a storage or a room would have been. Or you're looking down at the stairwell. So that's exactly what's going on with this building. Anyway, we're going to keep going. Um, this. We moved to something completely different. Uh, I wanted to sort of give you some other stuff other than just um, the, the Iron Age stuff. The Roman stuff. Uh, this is a this is a, a, a church that was built in about the 1200s, um, but the original building here dates back, say, to about the 700s. It was a really early Christian community there. I didn't actually get to see this side. Michelle went up there um, with somebody and came back with a big smile on her face. So I don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, I know it was a woman. Um, anyway, so the reason why she went here is that Saint Saint Ninian's Church was where they found loads of silver artifacts, silver bowls, uh, they, they found um, silver um, cro um, crochet top, not crochet, um, crozier tops, 
which are basically the staffs that they would have used walking down the church. We found that as well. Uh, they found some of those, and there, there was a hoard of this silver found there in 1958 by a by a schoolboy. Uh, well, there's a story associated with that. But let's look at let's look at who would have built that. A Christian community, monks. And you can see the outside. What they, they've had to, this was surrounded by. This was lost by about 1700s. Nobody knew where it was. So in the 1950s, they had to re-excavate it. So this Saint Ninians of Galloway. That's a causeway. Yeah, this is it, basically. There's the mainland, and this is the, the little island. Um, and you, you can only get to it using a causeway. But it's a nice little um, church. But here's the, there, here we go. Here's some of the artifacts that were found there by the, by this little boy, um, a school boy in 1958. And you've got these one, wonderful annual approaches. Um, these are all from about the 700s. Um, you've got these wonderful um, votive bowls. Um, and this would be an, uh, an incense burner bowl, obviously on the chain, this one here. These, these are clasps, probably um, from scabbard ends. Um, that, that's a pommel, a silver pommel. And those there are really large thimbles, but they're not thimbles, they're, they're crozier tops. Basically, crozier, um, as, as the, uh, the holy man is walking down the Christian church, you have a wooden staff, and you have a, a little silver crozier on top of the staff as they would walk down the church. It's a bishop staff. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's the description I've got anyway. Uh, this, this is the fight you lay on the silver bowls, um, Christian symbolism. And there they are. They're, they're really small, they're about three or four times the size of my, my thumb, that's why I call them sort of thumb thimbles. Um, and you've got a little hole there where it's connected into the wood staff. So, <laughs> don't we, we don't need to use that word anymore. Did you, did you hear that archaeologist on TV the other day saying that the Celts didn't exist um, and uh, there was no such thing as a Celtic invasion? Love it. I wish I knew who she was because... Uh, Exactly. Uh, I, they do use the term Celtic art, I know, but like the, the later, you know, like Irish and. Yeah, we'll forget that. Anyway, so this is that side of Scat Nest that we were excavated. Um, and obviously, that's building I was uh, particularly interested in there, alongside the road and ditch and all the rest of it. But the, they, they excavated more of that. The biggest problem with the site, they had, they had hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of funding. The funding ran out. And they did manage to complete the conservation of these walls. Now weeds are growing up amongst it all, and it's been really, really big shame. And I was talking to my lecturer when we went to the site. I said, "My God, you know, I've been studying this for eight months. Beautiful photographs of it, you know." And I come to this hole, um, and he said, "Yeah, he, he can't say anything, but I can, and I have." Uh, so there you go. There's the excavations. Um, exactly. Scarab Bray? No. The Rock. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. At um, Gurnas. Gurnas, yeah. At Midhow. Gurnas at Midhow, Mid yeah. Yeah, exactly. But obviously, the height of these settled, these buildings are a lot higher than the ones at um, Gurnas at Midhow. But the, pro the rocks at Gurnas at Midhow is obviously a bit taller than this. I'd, I'd, um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's why it's probably good. Are you still taking the asthma? No, it's not my asthma, I'm just, um, yeah. What? No, it's just not my asthma. It's, um, it's, um, I, I did actually say to Marie Lanter at Razor, I'll be lucky if I can manage to get through this afternoon. It's um, not man flu. It's not, if it, if it, if it, on, if it was man flu, I wouldn't be here. That's true. I know man flu, it's man flu. You're going, are you? Well, you said you were leaving to finish it early, so I waited. All right, yeah, we, we are finishing in a short while anyway, so yeah. Are you, why are you going that way? Well, he's told us, don't worry. Um, he said he'd be out. Oh, right, Pat. We are finishing in a minute anyway. So, are we'll we seeing you next week? Are we yes. doing next week? Yes. 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 Oh, have a good time. Yeah, we Stay All the best. Bye, Pat. Merry Christmas. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Bye,
Constructed buildings, we'll, we'll call it dynasty works as well. Um, and uh, and there, there you go. More, more, more of the. This was before um, it sort of started um, to grow over and stuff. But this is another site known as Giles Hoff. Um, and Giles Hoff itself um, on uh, Shetland. Uh, this is how a site should be excavated and left for display. Um, and you can see this is multiple layers. They've excavated this and they left it as they excavated it, uh, but they've obviously consolidated it and made it like this. It doesn't. These all date from 2000 years ago. Scarabrake dates from 3000 years ago. Uh, uh, 3000 years BC, so Scarabrake is right about Yeah. So, so what we're looking at here, here's the Iron Age. And here's the laws, and here's the later. And one thing I would clearly say about this uh, is that the most of this is practically intact. Uh, so when they built these, they took the material, the, that's basically new material, and then that was left there. Norse buildings did use a lot of stone anyway. And then um, eventually, uh, they built this structure uh, about the uh, 1400s, and that's using new material again. So this is a Giles Hoff, and in fact, it'd be great to do a lecture about Giles Hoff. Um, and there, there, there's more of this building, as you can see it. This is the this is a Scottish heritage site. You've got the wonderful south. Actually, I was thinking maybe um, I might choose one lecture topic. Um, and this. We, we, we visited lots of other Brock sites like, like this one as well. This is one at Lerdwick. Uh, this, this is, this is a, as well reconstructed. When the archaeologists reconstructed this in the 1920s, sort of made a lot of things up. But the other site that we've just seen at Giles Hoft, that's basically as it was excavated. Lots of this is another Brock structure that you've got these stairwells. Um, and that's basically that. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going I'm to call that a... Uh, because I've still got to drive back. Um, I'm going to come to you and lie down. So, any, any questions? So, where was that? Yeah. Did people live in them or not? Did you all do? There is no substantial evidence, one way or the other, that they did or they didn't. You can't live in the dark. You can't. Um, but then again, lots of Iron Age buildings. Were exactly the same as the Brock in a sense they had no light. But the Brock we saw in this day. Yes. Definitely had suspended Ah, right. Later on, the Brocks were occupied and lived in by people. Well, yes, but this is not where they were originally built. It's a bit like this building, right? It's a church, but we're going to turn it into a supermarket. So it's still there. Pardon? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, no, right. They would have had. They would have had light in them, right? Yeah, so they. But that, that was your light as the owner of the building. Yeah. But that's what you yeah. need if you have the box. Yeah, exactly, there. exactly, exactly. And nobody would intrude, would they? Because they couldn't find a way around. So that was your. Yeah. It. it yeah. Yeah. That's Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. So, are, are there any other questions today? Good. Right, so protocol, protocol, right? Next week, if I phone anyone in the room and say that I've got problems with parking, please answer the phone. Thank you. What? No, what, what I'm trying to say, at least you know. Yeah. Well, I couldn't do the Tesco's. But, but there is one good Time thing. On there is one good thing today. Yeah. There is one good thing today. I didn't finish at half three. I finished at four. So there you go. Thank you very much. Do you want to join us again? Yes. Yes? Who's yes. 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 joining next week?
Pat will be here next week. I'll have a parking space next week. Maybe you should. No, why not? Right, I haven't got a problem with George. It's whoever else bloody parks there. No, I don't have a problem. George will take you to the children. I didn't use my brain. Right. Oh, you did it. You were trying to help. I know. And you were trying to help. Deep it. I said, Deep it. He's fine. He's I knew he'd think the builders weren't there. So you'll be coming. And you know what yes, I do? I went down. I was like, oh, I just got a run down. Oh, do you want a raffle ticket, Anne? No, I gave you seven pounds. Oh, right, that was for a raffle. I, 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 I thought that was for the dog in. Well, I hope you have a lovely time, and George. I hope you have a lovely time. I think that's Dory. You think that's Dory? It is Dory. He said that. Yeah, he said that's for Dory. I, I believe right, everyone should experience syphilis once in their lives. It's only, it's only, it's only life thingamajig. 